All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another Gutter Fighting Secrets Tactical Podcast. Today, we are joined by a very special guest indeed, Mr. Tommy Moore of Bartitsu Labs. You guys probably know him out there. All of y'all who love the World War II combatives, uh, Mr. Tommy Moore is an authority on World War II combatives. Why we brought him on his YouTube channel, channel Bartitsu Labs, was founded in 2006. And uh, he is kind of a prolific martial artist of the modern age. I mean, boxing, judo, JKD, Thai boxing, I could go on and on. Uh, in addition to, you know, pugilism, uh, Bartitsu, World War II combatives. I mean, Tommy's really run the gamut and he's one of those guys that I respect a lot because he puts his money where his mouth is and he fights and he actually goes and tests this stuff out. I know, Tommy, one of your quotes before was, I like boxing and judo because I like to hurt and I like to get hurt. So good on you, mate. Um, welcome on to the podcast. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. So, uh, Tommy, I, I want to jump right into it and um, kind of get your take on where did you start or when and where did you kind of start with your martial arts journey and then let you kind of bring it from back then to, to, you know, sitting down with us right here, right now. All right, cool. Uh, so it started uh, when I was probably about age five and uh, boxing is, is quite common to both sides of my family. So um, on my mother's side, um, we were from a traveler community. So a, a Irish gypsy community, <laughs> um, all of those guys box, all, all the men in those families, they box. That's just a thing that you do. You know, you will always, 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 See, see gypsy lads boxing. Um, so from my mom's side of the family, that's that's a very common thing. And from my dad's side of the family too, um, more from the kind of military sense. And so, yeah, at the age of five, I was dropped into boxing, which is good because if you grew up in Britain and you grew up ginger, you need to be able to fight. It's an important thing. Uh, so I went there. Uh, it's also brilliant because it's cheap. So it's cheaper than nursery. It's cheaper than daycare. Uh, boxing gyms are open seven days a week. You can just leave your kids there and, and they will be fine. Uh, so I was dropped off there boxing since the age of five. Um, then there was a, a judo club that opened uh, nearby when I was about seven. So boxing and judo is what I did for, for many, 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 many years. Um, and it's it's been the two martial constants throughout my life. So, you know, I've picked up stuff and I've dropped stuff as I've gone on, as everybody does. But those two things, boxing and judo, have been kind of a, a constant red thread throughout my entire life. And then as I've got older, I've just, you know, in the same way that some kids experiment with drugs and some kids experiment with stupid hair and bad music, uh, I experimented with weird and wonderful ways to hit other people. Uh, so I'd pick up different arts as I go. So Jeet Kune Do uh, is a big one. Um, it's it's relatively popular in the United Kingdom compared to, to a lot of other places. So it's quite a good kind of groundswell of, of JKD guys. Uh, Thai boxing. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of Thai boxing in, in the UK as well. So all these things I just kind of picked up over time. You know, I spent oh, what, five, six years doing JKD, probably similar doing Thai boxing. Um, you know, and obviously from the JKD, you pick up other things like the Arnis, the Kali, and you, you, you branch and experiment and you, you play with all sorts of stuff. Um, in my younger years, it was more about the competitive martial arts. So, so the boxing and the judo were things where I was competing very, very often. And you'd turn up to some godforsaken leisure center somewhere and fight in front of 12 people and a dog. Um, but that's the, you know, I remember boxing was showing Glasgow once. Um, and I was the only English boxer on the show. And someone threw a, a, uh, a McDonald's burger at my face. <laughs> and it stuck on my face for what felt like a, an eon. Uh, like a, felt like a hundred years. That burger, middle of, middle of the fight, burger hits me on the face, just sticks there for a couple of seconds and slides <laughs> off like a, like a comic book story. Uh, but yeah, all, all, all these things, weird and wonderful. And I've, you know, I've been dedicated to, to martial arts my entire life, teaching it, doing it. Um, I'm, I'm very, very behind the fact that you've got to devote as much time to your training as you do to your teaching. It can become quite easy to become just a teacher or just a practitioner. So you know, always, always, always picking up new stuff. Like a couple of weeks ago, uh, I started to go to another boxing gym, which is uh, full of Cubans. Um, and the Cuban style of boxing is a million miles away from 
most other types of boxing. The footwork is different. How they move is different. Um, you know, it's like Russian boxing meets Mexican boxing, and they have an ungodly child, and that's Cuban boxing. Uh, and that, you know, that I'm always learning new stuff, and I really, really enjoy it. But yeah, boxing and judo have been my constants. Um, then predominantly sporting arts. Um, with with smatterings of combatives or what was used to be known as reality-based self-defense. I love that kind of stuff. Uh, but with that, I would say it's harder to keep interest or, or retain interest in reality-based stuff because by the virtue of it, the toolbox is small. You can do lots of scenarios and attribute development stuff. But you know, it comes a while where if you're not at immediate risk of being attacked, you want to experiment. You want to try other stuff because it's out there. And, and why the hell not? Um, but yeah, I, I love, love it all. I'm glad you brought up the reality-based martial arts stuff, man, because like you said, I, you know, I feel the same way. It is kind of a smaller toolbox and it doesn't give you that visceral feedback, right? I mean, you can go in, you can do it hard. You can wear cups and helmets and all that stuff, but it's not the same as boxing or judo. Um, do, you, do you think that a person would be better off just simply training grappling and boxing or is there a time and a place for that reality-based stuff as well i always say you know it's hard because if you're a reasonable human being then you understand that so many variables you know it depends on the human the situations your psychology your emotions yeah all, all these things are much more important than whether you throw a jab or an edge of hand blow you know that the the, the tool is you know, if you've if you've put some hate behind it, it's going to work. Whatever you do, um, for me, if it was say my daughter or my sister or, or someone that was important to me, and someone said, "Tommy, hand on heart, should I put them in six months of boxing and wrestling or six months of your typical reality based self defense program?" I would I would have to honestly say the boxing and wrestling, but I would. That's not because that those techniques or those methodologies are necessarily superior, but I know that the the median level of quality is always going to be much higher at a place that fights than one that doesn't. So you get really good and really bad combatives. You tend to get a pretty steady boxing and wrestling. You know, you you, you get what you pay for. You know, you you are. Um, so I would say that when it comes to the law of averages, playing it safe, that's what I'd recommend. But I'd say that the martial arts community has got very partisan. You're either the sports guy, the traditional guy, or the combatives guy. Mm -hmm. And all three parties don't like to get together. But I think all three elements are, are very important. And, and the best of people tend to weave the best of those things together. And if we look at martial artists that we respect and admire, even in recent history, we look at someone like, say, Carl Sestari, for example. He's looking at traditional jiu-jitsu. He's looking at modern boxing. He's looking at World War II combatives. And all of it's cool. All of it's fine. You know, I think that all the best people take special care to explore all three aspects. You know, Fairburn himself, you know, he's going to Kodokan Judo, a sport. And he's also going to Koryu Jiu-Jitsu, definitely a traditional martial art. You know, Chinese martial arts, weaving together bits of military boxing and wrestling. You know, he's, do, he's doing that experiment in, in real time. You know, traditional sports and combatives, smush it together and you get the best possible outcome for you. Um, so, you know, to, to go back to your original question, I think if I was playing the law of averages, you, you can play it safe with a combat sport. Um, if, in an ideal world, people devote good time to, to exploring all of what's out there. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's like Bruce Lee said, right? Like, take what is useful, reject what is useless, and kind of add what is uniquely your own. I think he said something along those lines. And um, it, it's it's the truest words that a martial artist could have ever given us, especially in his time. Now, I do want to touch on this um, right up front, because all our viewers are going to be furiously curious about this. How did you get into uh, gutter fighting, defend you, all of those World War II combatants? So... I am interested in what is known as HEMA, Historical European Martial Arts. Mm. And that's where you, you look back at, at systems of the past and you essentially do a bit of martial reconstruction in a way. So if you take Bartitsu, which is a, a thing that, that you know, I, I study and focus on, 
you're pulling together source material. So you're looking at boxing manuals from the early Victorian period. You're looking at savat. You're looking at catch wrestling. You're looking at it in a period of time because there are things that are very poignant at that period of time. For example, um, the boxing manuals of the time being a lot more focused on bare knuckle boxing, which is much more useful for someone that is trying to learn boxing for self-defense. You might as well cut out the middleman, the gloves, and look at how do I punch a man safely without gloves? And the books written at the time where that's the most common thing to do, those are the best sources. And so I was already good at pulling those bits and pieces together. And there's a burgeoning movement of picking up World War II sources. You know, everyone quotes Fairburn, but there's huge, huge amounts of World War II combatives materials. You know, huge amounts. There's got to be, what, 40, 50, 60, you know, that's probably that number's probably even low. I'd probably go to, to the to the middling hundreds, 150. You know, you, you yourself, you must have been through a lot of World War II material. You think of all the American material, British material, German material. God, there's even Finnish World War II combatives. Yep. You, know, you can go, you can go through the lot of it. Um, so there's a lot of material to, to to pull together, experiment with. And what I found looking at other people doing it was that a lot of the people doing it are either coming at from a historian's perspective, so without the martial skills necessary to make it relevant, they're just going through the motions of what they've seen in a book, which is cool, you know, if that's what they want to do. Um, so there's the historian aspect, and it's also, um, I'm looking for the probably the, it's quite politicised World War II combatives. There's, there's certain groups of people that think they own it, and they think they claim it, and everything belongs to them. Uh, and, and I found that very annoying. Um, and I, I like to annoy people. Uh, and, and so I look at things and look at what people are doing. And I'm like, is this the most combatively sound way to do the things that we see in the books? And, you know, I felt for many people, they weren't hitting the mark. And probably one of the main reasons they weren't hitting the mark is because none of, few of them had ever been properly punched, properly thrown, properly roughed up. And, you know, if I'm looking at how, let's just take Fairburn, for example, how Fairburn taught, it was from by example, you know, you, you all know yourself, you'd go to a big group of proud, arrogant, strong young men, and he would go pick a fight to make a point, wouldn't it? He'd be like, right, biggest guy over here, I'm going to make a point, and I'm going to rough you up a bit so everyone believes in my lesson. It's physical, it's tangible, you know, it's, it's that kind of hands-on transmission of learning. And I feel that if you haven't had that rough and tumble stage in your life, you know, via combat sports or via your chosen profession, let's say you're a bouncer, doorman, whatever, you know, if you've not had it from combat sports, you've not had it through your job, it's going to be hard for you to emulate fighting systems of fighting men. Uh, and so that's what I try and bring to the table. Uh, my main passion really is to take stuff like this, a piece of history, make it alive. And I like to go to places to help encourage people to explore it themselves. You know, so... You know, I will go around so many you know, karate clubs, jujitsu clubs, boxing clubs, you know, historical reenactors. I'll go to them all and do bits of World War II combative so that they themselves go download the PDFs, watch everything there is out there on YouTube, try it out for themselves. You know, there's nothing in it for me per se. I made the book because the book was cool and I enjoyed doing that. But, you know, you've seen my YouTube channel. It's got hundreds of hours of stuff for free that a lot of people would charge a lot of money for. Um, and in my opinion, it's probably a little bit better than a lot of the things that people would charge a lot of it money is. for. Um, but it's important for me. The main objective is to keep it alive and keep it relevant. And if I can do those two things or help do those two things, what, what greater way to honor someone's legacy? And that's, you know, that's important to me. If you can keep it alive in people's minds, so they get a passion for it and you do it in a way that's respectful to how it was intended you know, uh -huh. it was meant, meant for fighting. So if you keep it in those areas, you, I feel like you can't go too far wrong. And I don't think anyone's interpretation of it is wrong. Uh -huh. um, you, you get a lot of people that are very desperate to have a founding, like a living lineage. Right. Um, and there's a lot of desperation. And I, I would say it's probably more on your side of the pond than ours. Uh -huh. But there's lots of, you know, this person learned from this person that learned from this person. Therefore, I have the legitimacy 
more than someone else. But if you look at these training programs, these are churn out schools. These are someone has been learned for 12 weeks, given a kick up the arse and told to teach other people. You know, most of these instructors aren't particularly expert instructors. So you're looking at three to four generations off from someone that's only spent 12 weeks doing this stuff in right. the main. That's the vast majority of military combatives instructors are given a very short window of time, a very finite objective and told to just get on with it. Yeah. Uh, so it's not necessarily the best foundation just to have learned from someone that's learned from someone that learned from someone. And the great well, thing with people... Go on, Dennis, go ahead. No, it, I'm well put, and I really like where you're going with that, man. You, you touched on a couple of things that are very poignant. Um, number one being the, the desperation of some, you know, lineages to, to claim, well, this is, you know, I learned from this guy and this guy, and he learned directly from Pat O'Neill or directly from Fairburn. So, therefore, us or nobody, you know, a lot of people yeah. also really just like to talk smack, right? They just... You know, it's it's almost like the, the BJJ MMA community against everybody else, right? Like, if you don't train in MMA, then you're a pussy, and that's it. That's all there is to it. A lot of these schools out there, and, you know, I might know who you're talking about, but we probably shouldn't bring them up by name. Um, a lot of these schools out there, man, it, it, it's just the way it is. And I like that you bring up, you know, look, they get 10 to 12 weeks of training and being an instructor and then told, hey, go open the school or whatever. It's it's not the way that it necessarily should be, man. I mean, I like what you're doing here as far as balancing the history with it and then bringing it to a martial arts level, a street fighting level. And a guy like yourself who is proficient in violence, in my humble opinion, sh should really be the one kind of um, demonstrating and rather showing people these techniques. Because when you have some book nerd that never has had a fight in his life, it's not exactly, you know, it's not exactly the same as, as getting a fighter in there and saying, hey, let's test this stuff out. Would you say that you are more of a historian at heart or more of a fighter at heart? I would like to say I'm, I'm, I'm balanced in the middle. Um, you know, I, I spend a lot of my time fighting and training. You know, I've, I've boxed, what, four hours today, uh, yeah. just today, in, in this week alone. I'll have, I'll have clocked up, you know, in the past seven days, a huge amount of sparring time, fighting time, doing stuff. I've got a boxing match uh, November 13th. Okay. I'm, teaching, I'm teaching a seminar. So I've got a weekend seminar. Saturday I'm teaching. Then I'm fighting Saturday night. And then I'm teaching again Sunday. Wow. And then, Dece and then December 4th, I'm doing the exact same thing. Fighting on the – teaching people on the Saturday, fighting Saturday night, back – on Sunday teaching again. Now I've, because I believe in myself and, and, and what I can do. And, you know, whether I turn up having won those fights or completely horribly mangled, you know, it shows people in attendance that I stand by what I do. And, and that, that matters. You know, you got, I find that a lot of the big critics and the people that think they own World War II combatives, they don't make any content. They don't show any stuff. Mm. They, you know, I don't, I don't really care if they compete or not, but the vast majority of the big critics out there don't actually show themselves doing anything worth a damn, or they spend all their time reposting things that their instructor did. It's <laughs> like, well, that's great, but he's been dead 20 years. So, you know, what's the difference between training with you and buying his video? Right. <laughs> you know, I, I feel that it's important to be able to, to, to back yourself on stuff. And, and, and I strongly believe that we would achieve a lot more in World War II combatives if we spend a lot more time working together. People can disagree on stuff. That's cool. You know, that's, that, that's fine. But there's no need to have all these big fights and schisms and arguments. Because let's be honest, it's niche enough as it is. You know, yeah. it's, not like, it's not like we're karate or kung fu or BJJ where there's a big enough community that people can be in tribes. What we do... There's probably only thirty thousand people in the world that care. Yeah. <laughs> in the world, you know. <laughs> so it's you know that all they care, you know, to, to some degree. So <laughs> so let, people need to collaborate more and connect more and be in fewer cliques and just you know reach out and chat and do stuff. You know. That's... I couldn't agree with you more, Tommy. And you know, what do you think about these guys who supposedly have like the secret techniques that Fairburn only taught to? 
you know, commandos, but they can't share it with you, but they know it. So you don't know anything. Have you, have you run into those guys? Oh, all the time. All yeah. the time. Um, constantly on my channels. I know, uh, like I've got, you've probably got these as well. There's a small cadre of dislikers. You know, anytime you put a video up, they, there's not enough time elapsed for them to have watched a third right. of that video. <laughs> they down and go like, I know who you are. I know where you are. Uh, I appreciate the fact you've subscribed enough to dislike stuff. That's cool. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, th I think we I think we both unspeakingly know the, the, the culprits of this type of stuff. Yeah. Um, and they shall, they shall go unnamed. And that's fine. You know, I feel a bit sorry for them because, you know, if you think about Fairburn, you open up the front of uh, all in fighting. And it, Fairburn's like, if you know boxing or if you know rugby, you'll probably be all right. Paraphrasing Fairburn there. But the front of his book is like, this is not designed to replace things that help you be good at fighting. It's designed to augment or supplement those things. You know, it's at the very front of the book. And you know, if you try and emulate a man such as Fairburn, you got to appreciate how open-minded that man must have been yeah. because he is, a, he is a British civil servant at the time of empire. You know, he's a... He's a senior police officer, yeah. which would have made him an absolute snob, a social yeah. snob. And the idea of learning something from a Japanese person or a Chinese person, for the vast majority of British people at that time, would be seen as just something you wouldn't do. You know, mm. it would have been seen as beneath you to have, have to have considered that. Mm. You, know, you take a man like Fairburn that will, who's, who's, who's meant to be in charge of controlling this city, really, and he, he's going to train with Chinese people, you know, Chinese people being viewed as the sick men of Asia at this time. Mm -hmm. But he's going to learn Chinese martial arts and he's going to the Japanese, a rival colonial power and learning Japanese martial arts. And he could only have ever unlocked those doors if he would have turned up, put his white belt on and go and teach me something, you know, to have complete humility to be accepted. And you know what it's like with old school Asian combatives, unless you are entirely humble you're not getting anywhere. You know, yeah. You're know, you not getting through the door because humility is part of their game. The whole point is to show how humble you are, how deferential you are. So unless you've got that humility, you know, he would have never have accessed all of that content. Um, so for me, if you try and emulate someone like Fairburn, it's very obvious that there's no secrets. You know? He talks about it. You know, if, you, if you know other stuff, that's absolutely cool bring it to the table, use it. He references specifically boxing and rugby at the front of All In Fighting. And the, the fact that he's, he's open enough to learn from, from all sorts of people, many of whom were probably much less experienced than him. Yeah. You know, you think about what Fairburn would have learned in, say, Bagua, Chinese martial arts. He probably would have thought 80% of it a complete waste of time and thought, oh, 20%, I'll take that, that's cool. You know, the tiger claw, I'll have that. I'll probably ditch those bits and keep those bits. You know, that's, he's a, he's a pragmatic, open-minded, fair person. And I think he would be disappointed that, that people try and, and close doors and close ranks as opposed to trying it, testing it, sharing it. You know, Fairburn's a publicist. You know, he's a, he's a man that's churning out books at, at speed, at pace. He's a showman. He rolls downstairs. He fights groups of young squaddies to, to show off, so make his lessons land better. He's an open door kind of man. He's not a closed door man. So to act in a closed door way is, is, is quite sad. Um, but it's more sad for the people. You know, those people in those small circles, those circles aren't growing. They're not getting no. more fans. They're no. not getting more followers. And they're slowly getting very old and very fat. And they're shuffling off this mortal coil. And that's good to be honest, because it means that more people that just have a fresh, interesting passion for this stuff can, can have a go. You know, no one knows. No no one knows. And and to be frank, I think Fairburn Blight, if you can make it work, cool. <laughs> That's that. Yeah, I mean, this stuff was meant for, for life and death combat, right? And if, yeah. if you could make something work and kill a German or a Japanese with it, then I think he'd be all about it. You know, I, I don't think he would have shunned you away if you brought a different technique to the table, like you said. And we've got to take off, you know, rose-tinted glasses in that you know, there's, there's a, at least a third of, uh, let's just pick on Fairburn again, of stuff in there, which is entirely nonsense, entirely stupid, yeah. that you would be suicidal to try. You know, think about things like the Bronco kick. So people watching this don't know. Man's on the ground. You jump in the air with both feet and land on his chest. 
and the man dies. <laughs> Can you think of all the things that could go horribly wrong with that? <laughs> yeah. Jumping on a man that's moving, that doesn't want to die, that's covered in a backpack, webbing, canteens, bottle, rifle, expecting that to crush his chest enough to, to kill him, expecting that you won't fall over doing that while you've got backpack, rifle, uniform, it's muddy and it's wet. You know? Are you expecting that to A, kill a man, B, not result in you falling over? You know, it's a ludicrous technique. And if anyone ever tests it in earnest, it's, you know, nine times, if you can make it work, good for you. But for, you know, there are so many things that, that make that, compared to just kicking a man's face in and stamping on his head like a normal human, you know, there's, at least you're on balance. Everyone knows how to do it. It's intuitive. You can't miss. And you can do it while you've got all your gear. And he's got his gear on. Everything else just increases risk. You know, so you've got to look at the sources with, with, with a, a detached eye too. You can't just fall in love with it because it's World War II and World War II is cool. You have to be like, this stuff I think is good. This stuff not so good. This stuff made sense for its time, but not now. And you've got to put all that content into different drawers. And there's lots of arrest and restraint style holes in a manual, which is designed for kill or be killed. You know, they don't make much yeah, sense and yeah. explains why, why Sykes got rid of a lot of them when he's, you know, so for the SOE syllabus in the UK, a lot of that stuff left, whereas Fairburn having gone to the US, some of it stayed. So you might then argue that a lot of people that claim, say, an American lineage in this stuff, they might be picking up techniques that are just superfluous for, 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 for proper gutter fighting, whereas, mm. say, what Sykes was doing, if you ever look you know, um, at, at Sykes syllabi, what, what you're learning, you're learning the basic strikes, Japanese strangle, one or two throws. That's it. That's you done. Yeah, you know, knock him out, knock him down, strangle him to death. It's simple. Yeah. Uh, so, I think that the, the main point I got to in a very convoluted way is that you need to analyse World War Two materials with all the best things the modern world provides you with, which is more context, more sources, more chance to experiment, and you've got to take what's good and and and. You know, what isn't as effective, you need to, uh, to decide, are you going to keep that alive as a living museum? So I'll teach it, but not advise it for modern self-defense. But if people want to see it because it's in the books, that's cool. You know, I think as long as you're honest with your students about what they're learning and what it's good for, you're doing a good job as an instructor. You know, do this if your life's in danger. Do this if you just want to try out the, you know, the cigarette case strike you know you're not going to carry a cigarette strike case ever in your life but try it out because it's cool uh, yeah, that, that's important to me yeah and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up um you, you actually brought up a few points that i want to touch on here now number one um the difference between kind of how americans and brits are raised and how we fight and how even back in world war ii our psychology was a little bit different uh, americans and i think this is touched on a lot in you know, old World War II documentaries or uh, films like Kill or Be Killed, uh, it really hammers home the point that in America, we're, we're raised with kind of a fair play mentality, right? Boxing, basketball, fo American football, things like that. Um, and we have, and we always have had kind of that mentality of let's make it a fair fight. Whereas overseas in, uh, in Britain, you guys are an island of warriors who have been doing that for a long time. And uh, you have a different mentality. And I fought Brits. And you guys are savages, quite frankly speaking. And um, do you think that there is a, and still is, was and still is, a solid kind of break in psychology or break in difference between um, the British people and the American people when it comes to fighting? Um, I think when it comes to World War II, you, you got to understand that the vast majority of, of World War II combative content content comes from very early in the war and so when when britons are learning this stuff they're coming at it from a point of pain in that britain is being bombed to hell and we're frankly we're losing you know we've not been invaded but bombs are landing all over the country shipping is being sunk in the atlantic you know it's a bad time and people are hurting and people are dying so i think there's a bit more spite there's a bit more hate there's a bit more pain because it could really happen whereas i think a lot of the earlier american combatives are almost 
a fun way to engage some Marines. Mm. You know, in, in the early starts of the war, it's what things could we add to physical fitness training that keeps the Marines having fun and enjoying themselves and testing, you know, building attributes. Right. Whereas, you know, in Britain, there is unarmed combat manuals, you know, uh, you know example here. You know, we've got things like the art of guerrilla warfare, these little pamphlets. And these are going out all around the country because they think that the invasion is going to happen in a couple of weeks. So the content you're getting in something like this is Nazis will come, they will invade this country, and whether you've got a pointy stick, the edge of your hand, or your granddad's shotgun, you're going to have to fight them. So it gives a bit more immediacy to it. It's more real. Um, as the war goes on, and you know Americans then join the war, some of the latter stuff, it makes a lot more sense. It has a lot more context to it. Um, you know, you, you start to look at some of the you know American combat judo and things like that. It starts to make sense for the theatres of war that Americans are, are finding themselves in. You know, a huge amount of the American material is designed for the Eastern theatre, isn't mm -hmm. it? You see so much of that. Uh, because Britain had spent so much time in the Western theatre, in the European theatre, I think that's why a lot of things like the Fairburn system were just picked up easily. Like, well, it's working for these guys. It'll work for us. Let, let's, let's roll with it. Uh, those kind of things don't necessarily work so well in island hopping, raiding expeditions. You need something a bit different for that type of warfare. And that's where you get some of the, the, the interesting American stuff. Um, but I don't think combative, there's a big difference. British films and British content still has that, you know, don't worry about fair play. Sometimes you need to kill a man. You know, there's all that kind of stuff in there anyway. Um, but I do feel that there is a there is a more pressing sense that you may actually need this stuff in British sources that you don't tend to get in other sources. You know, oh. if you know America's so far away from from the very pointy end of the war that you know it's unlikely that an average civilian is ever going to have to learn some stuff. Where you've got the Home Guard and territorial units in the UK that this stuff, unarmed fighting and using sticks and knives and knuckle dusters, that might be all they've got. Um, and and you know, there's a very good chance that the Germans could have invaded. So I think there's the sense of fear and risk and hurt made the uptake of World War II combatives really poignant in Britain. And it's a relatively disarmed country. So you also have to remember the psychological power of feeling like you can fight back so if you having guys trained in unarmed combatives, the chances of them using it are very, very small. But the feelings of security and safety and confidence that that might give them, that's an important thing for an island nation to keep fighting. Mm. You know, if you've got supplies and you've got confidence and morale, you can keep fighting for a long, long time. And so I think one of the key benefits it had for Britain, different to America, is its ability for PR and morale and mm. confidence of the nation. Well put, man. And that was going to be my, ne my next question, in fact, is um, seeing as how you're also really well-versed in, you know, Barkitsu and pugilism and old styles of fighting. I mean, do you think that people today fight differently than people used to fight, even going back to World War II and then even before World War II? It seems to me that maybe people just – had a different way of kind of mechanically moving. Do you put any credence into that? Well, people are so exposed to, you know, the, this transmission of content that is ambient. You know, you don't go looking to learn. But if you imagine a young man growing up now, let's say he was born in the early 2000s, odds are he'll have watched a couple, you know, at least a couple of UFC matches. He'll have watched and engaged content, even passively, even if they're not a big fan. You know, so you'll know what a rear naked choke looks like. You'll you'll have a vague notion of what ground and pound looks like and a, a vague notion of what a number of techniques look like that wouldn't have been anywhere near in the public consciousness back then. So th there are certainly things that a person is exposed to now that might give them different techniques or different things to try. But by the same token, I'm a very big proponent of uh, of have happy habitual acts of physical violence that you know humans when they are really being violent with each other tend to do a small amount of things 
And you see things like top level boxers at weigh-ins and jujitsu fighters when they feel like someone's cheated. When trained martial artists or combat sports people, as soon as you sprinkle a bit of real hate in those scenarios, all of their discipline goes out the window and they fight in the same way that humans have been fighting since we were stabbing mammoths. You know, you watch, you know, Tyson and Lennox Lewis kick off at the news conference. Suddenly they're not jabbing, bobbing, weaving. There's no peekaboo. There's no, you know, there's no slipping. There's no, there's none of this stuff. They're just two men having at each other, throwing bombs in the, in the same way that they've always done. So I think there are habitual acts of physical violence that, People, when they're emotionally invested in that violence, they just do, because that's what's in us to do. Um, but I would say that on top of that, there is more awareness now of what else is out there. It's been it's easier than ever before to learn stuff. If you've got a small interest, you could even you could go on YouTube as a young person or an unstable person or as a terrorist, you know, and you could pick stuff up pretty well. You know, let's say you've got a mind for terror. Without even doing a day's training with a real human, you could still learn some pretty tasty stuff online. You know, yeah. we always we always laugh at people that learn online, but you know, within two hours, someone that doesn't know how to stab could find enough content to learn how to stab very well. You know, <laughs> without much effort whatsoever. So, so you got to you got to appreciate the fact that the media and the opportunity out there for those that seek it is huge, and even those that don't seek it, there is greater exposure than ever before and that physical culture is bigger now than it, than it ever what really was you know more i don't know if it's like this in the us but it's now expected for a young man to be what we'd call hench ripped you know it's uh -huh. we're expecting 14 15 year old guys to look like rambo and arnold schwarzenegger you know the the models of fitness that we had probably you and i as young men you know those guys are super fit and that's going to be only 2% of people. Yeah. Now, there's a huge percentage of people that are, are really built, that are really, you know, to spend a lot of time in the gym because that's the look, that's the current look to have, to wear very tight shirts, look like a cloud, and very tight jeans. That's, that, that's the look that everyone has. So that's another danger now that we've got people that are a lot bigger, a lot more physically capable, there's also a lot of terribly fat and out of shape people, don't get me wrong, but there's also you know a big, big gym culture now in the Western world that changes the game a little bit more, makes opponents a bit more dangerous. Uh, people's respect of the law and sense of social consequences is much less. You know, as towns and cities get bigger and bigger and bigger, there's no sense of shame. You know, if you were to get into a bar fight and really kick the shit out of someone in a village of 300 people, you'd feel ashamed afterwards a little bit. You'd be like, oh, you know, maybe I went too far. You do that in a nightclub or a bar in a big city now, it's completely anonymous. You know, that's, so I think people's fear of the consequences has also lessened and changed and moved. So fitness, an understanding of different martial platforms and changes of ethics, I think have changed the way people fight somewhat, yeah. Bring up fitness. Um, what is your philosophy behind martial fitness? Everybody kind of has their own. Um, would you say that more weights, less cardio, more cardio, less weight, something in between? Uh, that's a, that's a tough one because like I, have, I've got too much weight on me right now. So I'm by no means a svelte or a slim guy, um, but I can move rapid. Now I can, I can box very fit kind of leathery welterweights and speed for speed i'll be exactly the same hmm. i think that you need functional fitness for the things that matter to you so if your job is to be a professional bodyguard then you need sufficient fitness to pick up and drag your principal for you know 30 50 meters bundle him into a car you need there's a certain there's the types of nature of fitness you need for that are going to be different to what an MMA fighter needs that your average dad is, is, is going to need. So as long as you feel fit for the tasks that you care about, I think that's the only thing that matters. And But what I would say is that the more you can functionalize your fitness, you know, nothing gets you better for boxing than boxing, nothing that gets you better for wrestling than wrestling. 
And wrestlers don't need to lift a lot of weights to be very strong, very fit, very muscled individuals. Um, so I think if you do the thing that you're interested in hard enough and often enough, you'll get the subsequent fitness. Um, but you know, there's always benefits to being more athletic. Being stronger, fitter, faster will always be a benefit and never be a drawback. So you can only ever improve upon yourself if you are more athletic. You know, no one's ever fought worse because they were more athletic. You know, it's never happened. Yeah. They might have lost on technique or timing or power, but on fitness, stamina, athleticism, you know, it's never going to hurt you to have more of it. Um, but so it's all about balance for your needs. Do you have a professional need for violence? Do you have a you know, do you have a professional sporting need for violence? Do you have a military profession? Do you have a policing profession, security profession? They all need different kind of fitnesses in the same way that the fitness of a soldier needs to be different to the fitness of a police officer. Mm -hmm. If you're a police officer that can't do a foot chase, you're not going to be a very successful police officer. So sprinting is going to be more important to you than the marathon. If you're a soldier that can't keep up a steady march or a jog over 20 miles, you know, that's bad. But you don't need to maybe sprint as fast as potentially the police officer might need to do running through the neighborhood. You know, it's completely, you know, it's so dependent on you. I'd say as long as you feel capable and it allows you to deploy your skills, then, then that's good. But also, if there are fitness facilities near you, if there are experts, nutritionists, use them you know i think you, know, you you can never you can never have enough advantages so you know if you're a if you're a small man well, you know get stronger because you're not going to get taller <laughs> it's a, you know, if you're a fat man get thinner <laughs> yeah it, it's it, it's all about just giving yourself those extra edge extra edge you know, and they're all points you know having good awareness adds a couple of points having good fitness adds a couple of points. Having good technique adds a couple of points. It's a cumulative game of lots of angles, having a couple of extra points. And the more you get, the better you'll be. Well said, man. I mean, that's a really refreshing viewpoint. You know, I hear a lot of guys talking a lot of stuff, but rarely do I hear them put it, just kind of point it like that, where, hey, you should have the level of fitness to whatever your profession or whatever your desire uh, to do or be is. And, you know, that's, that's really well said. Now, I do want to ask you about your opinion on just everybody else, right? Kind of the civilian out there, maybe they go to a nine to five office job or whatever. Is there a certain level of uh, martial prowess or physical preparedness that people like your average civvy out there, in your opinion, kind of should have just for a basic self-defense uh, level? And so in, in terms of fitness? Yes, uh, fitness and also martial uh, abilities. So I, I think in terms of fitness, everyone should be able to sprint between 100 and 300 meters at a relative, relatively good speed. Because let's say there's a, there's a knifeman that work, enters your mall or shopping center. Yeah, you're going to want about 100 to 300 meters at least away from that madman with the knife. Yeah, anyone that's ever shot a girl in their lives they'll know how hard it is to aim a pistol and shoot something. As soon as it goes past, you know, a couple of meters and you're under stress, you can miss a big person closer than you'd like. Embarrassingly, it's, it's embarrassingly easy to miss with a gun for most people. It really is. You know, it, it's easy at the range, but even the, even the pressure of a timer, any degree of pressure makes a good man fuck up a lot of the time. So you need to be able to get out of job dodge get off the x fast so i think you need to be able to move a decent speed between 100 and 300 meters um, that's an important baseline for anyone if danger happens get 300 meters away from it and then get 300 more and then 300 more yeah. <laughs> keep going but unless you've nailed that first 300 things are going to get difficult for you mm. and then i also think and this is more for professionals and also parents you need to have the upper body strength to be able to carry or assist someone for a good portion of that too. So if you've got the muscular strength to pick up, say, your child, your, your spouse, whatever, you also need to be able to do that 100 meters, that 150 meters, carrying something heavy and not collapse, because that could be your child. 
And that could be just a baseline thing. Your child could have just been hit by a car, you know, let alone you're helping your child escape the gunman because their legs are really small. You know, that child might only be three, but they, anyone that's ever carried a squirming, scared child knows it requires strength. You know, it's not, it's not even a small light person that's afraid is a heavy person. Mm -hmm. So you know, for me, if you can run 100 to 300 meters relatively well and you can pick up the weight of an average human and, again, go that distance relatively quickly, that's a level of functional fitness which is universal. It will help you in the vast majority of physical attack scenarios, be it civilian, military, police. You can get that far away from someone or help a person get away from someone. That's perfect. When it comes to martial elements, I think that your well, Jeff Thompson had a very good quote, and he's like, "If you're willing to invest that many hours of your life learning how to drive a car, could you not at least spare six to learn how to defend yourself a little bit better?" Hmm. Um, if I had my way, then physical self protection would be a mandatory thing in schools. I think it's the perfect time for it um, when you've got lots of young people together in their formative years. You know, what would it cost to have instead of 15 PE, le PE lessons to learn some basic physical self-protection you know, and a little bit of awareness and first aid? It, it, would, it, would, cost, it would cost the world nothing, um, but it would benefit a lot of people. Um, I can't really say what a minimum viable level of martialism is, because, again, that's really dependent on your body type. If you're a small, skinny woman, the things that you need to drill are going to be very different from, from quite a big guy. So, again, it's, it's all about those personal risk assessments. If you can take it, it takes five minutes to personally assess yourself on risk, and it requires no skill whatsoever. What are the top five most likely dangers I'll have in my life? In, a normal, in, in my normal life, what are my five top kind of, attack dangers that I may face and, and how do I mitigate against them and what skills might I need and if people can go through that exercise they're already halfway there because they've thought about it that gives you an advantage against most people the fact you've even taken the time to think about it um, but but yeah it, it, is, it is a tough one um, I think people should be encouraged more to learn how to defend themselves there's been a lot of cases in the in the UK at least where Especially when it comes to female self-defense, a lot of, I feel it's an awkward thing to say, but screw it. Uh, there's been a lot of women saying, why should we learn? Just tell the men to not do this. You know, just tell the men not to rape. Tell the men not to attack. Educate your sons. Don't protect the daughters. You know, there's, there's that kind of line of thinking, um, which is terribly naive um, because there will always be bad men and bad women. Um, that will always be the case. And you can't, you can, you can, Hopefully society tries to stop that a little bit, but that will always be the case. Um, and so all you can do is increase your percentage points of survival. Um, fitness, martial arts, awareness, all these things, the more you do, the better you'll be, the safer you'll be. Um, what, I, what I disagree with is there's a big drive in combatives to make things small. So people will use the fact that you can learn it in a weekend or a couple of hours as a good thing. Uh, they'll say, well, you know, other systems, uh, they'll say, don't do karate, you'll, you'll, that'll take five years. Learn Krav Maga, and you'll, you'll learn everything you need to know in this three-day weekend course. Whilst conceptually the idea of we'll teach you fewer things and drill them is good, it's only really useful if you're training on Friday because you think you'll be attacked on Monday. You know, but most people will never get attacked in their entire adult lives. So... Invest the time to train as much as you possibly can. I think using you can learn it really quickly is a false virtue. Yeah, it's useful in the short term, but it's never going to burn in those those immediate kind of pathways that you need. That's years and hours and hours and years of of, of, of hard work, and there's no shortcut for hard work. How how important do you think repetition is when it comes to self defense techniques? It is, it is important, but I think what's more important is variables. So you, people will say you don't learn, let's just say a right cross. They'll say you, you don't know a right cross until you've done 10,000 right crosses or 100,000 right crosses. And there's some value to that. 
But I also think that, you know, 2,000 of them, you should be on top of a person. Mm. 2,000 of them, you should be sat in a chair. 2,000 of them, you should be carrying shopping or a small child in one hand. You know, the, the variables of life are as important as the repetitions. Mm. Um, so one of the, one of the things I, I, I get for people is um, what I call real-life shadow boxing, where I'll get them to just live you know, go to an ATM, go to a shop, you know, use a, uh, I'm not sure what you would Americans call this, uh, we, we call it a pram, a stroller, you know, you, you're right. moving along with a, a small child. Do the normal things of life, using your hands to do those things, and then be able to do the technique. You know, can I throw my right cross as I'm carrying my luggage? You know, think about the amount of people they get attacked on holiday or traveling for business and they've got, you know, they're carrying a suitcase in one hand. Can I land that right cross while I'm carrying, you know, 30 kilograms of suitcase? Because that might be the time you need that right cross. It's very unlikely, unless you're in your early 20s and going to bars, that it's going to come from a push. We say, the martial arts community tends to obsess over self-defense scenarios that only really pertain to young men at bars. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, we tend to have two scenarios, but in our minds, rape or bar fights and that's all we've got and and the martial arts community spends so much time on those they forget normal fights and where normal fights happen and normal assaults happen and and that's not really the case for most people you brought up briefly and i think that as martial artists who also study history we have a tendency to really nostalgize the past um yeah. culture was different back then but there is also a definite difference between culture back then. And even if we just go back to, you know, 50 years ago, it was a lot different than it is today. Tommy, what, what do you think about the culture today, man? I mean, this is kind of one of those questions that's maybe a little bit off topic or even a little bit um, politically incorrect. But what do you think about the culture and, and how we're going uh, as of right now these days? Uh, one thing that saddens me is that people can't disagree anymore respectfully. Um, and, and I find that well, because I, I like to think that most humans aren't polarized. You know, we're not left or right. We're not this or that. You know, we're all somewhere on a scale mm -hmm. in, in all of our views. We might have right, vi right wing views on some stuff and left wing views on other stuff. You know, no one human is a or b they're somewhere in in the middle of this this great thing and that leaves lots of things that humans could agree or disagree about and i find that people are are very quick to cancel each other and to blame each other and to not listen to each other um, and the the platform for reason debate you know people tend to talk too much now with passion and not enough reason and understanding um and, and, and I find that quite sad. Um, I, like I like passionate people. I think it's great that people of all sides of the spectrum are ballsy enough to disagree and, and say stuff. Uh, that's cool. You know, whatever your views are, you know, I applaud people that feel they could make a statement. You know, let's, take, let's take, for example, um, a lot of people in the world love and hate Greta Thunberg, you know, the, 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 the Swedish girl, the, the, the climate change girl. But... Whether you like her or hate her, it takes a lot of bollocks to stand up as a 16-year-old and, and say stuff and, and, and argue and debate with people that are older, smarter, that have been around longer, you know, that have had time to figure out their, their arguments for you. So whether you agree or disagree with someone like that, it's cool that someone feels able to, to, to put their views out there. Um, so I think my hardest thing with the culture today is being able to respectfully debate, disagree, and discuss. And I also think what's a real shame is it's become a taboo to have your mind changed. People mm. get so entrenched in a view that even if they've received a compelling argument otherwise, and they might believe it, they feel they can't allow themselves to change their mind. Mm. And that's really unhealthy. And I think that also loops back to martial artists. A lot of martial artists, they make their core materials and they're too ashamed to look back and say, oh, actually, that was shit. That was shit. Yeah. That was good. You know, that they, they, they have too much pride for that to confess that their mind may have changed. Um, but that's such a healthy thing. 
You know, I'm, let's imagine Fairburn lives into the 1960s, you know, 1960s, 1970s, and he looks back. He's obviously going to want to change a lot of this stuff. He'd be mad not to. He might look and go, Bronco kick. What the fuck was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> Screw that. Why would I do that? You know, that, that's a, a normal, healthy human thing. And people are often too afraid to change their mind. And people are often too judgmental of those that have changed their mind. You know, if you imagine whether it comes to politics, music, views, opinions, martial arts, as soon as someone changes their position, everyone's quick to point the finger and say, ah, that's not what you said two years ago. Yeah. That's fine. You can, people can change their mind on all sorts of things. And you're never going to win a debate if you don't allow your opponents to have their minds changed or be open to the fact yourself that you could be wrong. Um, and that, that's, that's important. So debate, discussion, understanding. And I think a lot of that can be solved at school level in that if there was more open discussion, debate, argument out there, if you look at kind of the older Greek, Roman ways of learning, being able to debate, discuss, public speak, that's a skill and an art that yes. is really important to everyone, whether you're doing a job interview or discussing politics or you know, <laughs> convincing a woman to marry you. Whatever you're doing, you need those skills. Uh, and, and those skills, I think, are sadly lost. And we tend to just focus on other things like biology, physics, maths. Yeah. We learn subjects, but we fail to learn what it is to be human. And humans are social animals. And there are certain social skills that you need to survive. And being able to debate, discuss and have your mind changed is as important for everywhere in your life as it is for, for self-protection. For example, you know, it, if you don't have the inbuilt knowledge that you could be wrong, you having a traffic argument with a guy because he thinks you've been driving too slow. You, you might have been driving too slow. You, know, you might have cut that guy up. You might be wrong. You know, the more people learn early that you could be in the wrong too and, and learn how to, how to accept that and be a gentleman about it, you know, the, the, the fewer fights you'll be in and the more you'll get on with people and, and the less chance you are of being stamped on a motorway somewhere for no reason. You know, <laughs> Absolutely, man. And I think that a lot of people, you know, if you if you and I uh, or a lot of our viewers were to get into an altercation on the roadway, it would be a lot different than if two unexperienced fighters or, un, you know, people who didn't know how to fight got into it with each other. Right. Because you and I would probably say, all right, bro, like, I'm sorry. You know, you're, you're right. Like, I, I was probably driving too slow. Like, sorry. Could I, you know, could I get out of your way? Right. Whereas two guys who really, you know, they just watch UFC on TV automatically they're going to go at it and butt heads just to impress themselves or whatever. Right. Um, yeah, I think it's really interesting, the different psychology of how people operate, whether you're a seasoned fighter, whether you're just, you know, watch gutter fighting secrets and Markitsu on YouTube, or whether you're just that, you know, typical guy that goes to the bar, uh, that you and I were kind of discussing earlier. And I know that you're really into, um, defensive psychology, survival psychology and stuff like that. How important do you think it is to study not only the physical prowess of, you know, fighting, but also that mental game behind the whole the whole art? I think it's important, but I think that it should come with a word of caution in that we tend to, in the reality based self defense world, take out a lot of physical techniques that we think are, uh, are unnecessary, and that gives people a bit more space to get really good at a couple of techniques. But then, unfortunately, we also tend as a community to then pump into that gap lots and lots of pseudoscience. Mm. I'll give you a great example. So, and I'm very guilty of this too. So this is, this is, this is me practicing what I preach about, about being wrong. For example, you, like I, have probably spoken to people about the, the color codes and the OODA loop and thing, things, things like that. Yeah, you can see these are just universal. You know, the OODA loop is universal as a concept. How useful it is for the average man to go through learning the concept of the OODA loop, I do not know, because the OODA loop happens whether you like it or not, and it happens to you and it happens to me. You can't control it. It's a natural process. There's not a great deal you can know, or there's not a great deal of benefit to be had by knowing it exists. Uh, and a lot of the things about it are, are obvious. 
the first person to do a thing is going to be better than the person reacting to a thing. Most humans know this innately. You know, the attacker will beat the defender nine times out of ten. Humans already know this from just playing around being a kid. You know, if you're if you're fighting around with tubes of, of Christmas wrapping paper and you're sword fighting with it, you know that if you move first, you'll hit the person. It's just innate. We, we, we know things. And I think we tend to fill gaps with lots of theory for people that potentially is just baggage. It's mm. baggage. Um, so the mental game is important. But I would say that physical prowess knowing that you are not made of glass, as we say in the UK. So you can you can be hit, you can hit and you can be hit and you won't explode into a thousand pieces. You can survive it. Having that knowledge will give you such confidence that you cannot replicate with any other type of mental activity. Because until you've been in the rough end of it, you only suspect you know. If you've had a couple of hard spars, you've fought, you've, you've worked in dangerous places around the world, or a combination of those three, there's something in you that just emanates confidence and capability. And that projection of confidence and capability deters most predators and most threats. So knowing you can and trusting you can defend yourself physically has great mental benefits, confidence. And I always say confidence breeds competence. If you're confident, everything's better. If you're unconfident, even a, ma a man that's got all the same attributes, all the same fitness, all the same skills, but he's less confident, he will lose. So you know, confidence building, I think, is a really important thing. So I think if, you, if people are building their students' mind games and their, their, ability, their mental power, Devote as much time as you can to making them confident as you are giving them awareness theory and de-escalation theory. And all, all those things are good, but they will never be more important than confidence and <laughs> self-reliance and resilience. You only get that from having your metal tested a little bit. Um, and I, I think that matters. Uh, but in terms of, of, of the mental stuff, yeah, awareness and avoidance are, are the key skills. And I think the best way to transmit that is with real stories, you know, hmm. by just engaging, watching stuff. Tim Larkin is great at it. You know, I don't always agree with 100% of stuff that Tim Larkin does physically, but his video breakdowns of people's awareness, you know, champion kickboxer getting knocked out by a George Foreman grill being swung at his head. You know, that just buries itself in your mind to say, I need my head on a swivel. I need to be looking. Yeah. You know, so, so storytelling is important. Real life case studies are important. Um, a small amount of theory, but I call it weaponized theory. You can boil down all the theory into, into a couple of things that, that the average human can remember. Um, so for me, one of the main things that I implant in, in most people is self-talk. So if, you, if you're walking in an area that feels dangerous, just say what you're worried about in your own head. Hmm. You know, it's a bit dark on that corner. My phone battery is running a bit low. Yep. Um, I don't actually know where I'm going. You know, the more you just say the dangers in your mind, the more you're psychologically prepared for them. Hmm. You know, I can't quite run in these shoes. My shirt's a bit tight for fighting. If you've thought about it, you can already mitigate against all these things. So you know, if, you, if you give yourself a quick threat assessment and just call out in your mind what those dangers are, you're already ahead of the curve. You're already ahead of the game. Yeah, there's a group like of lads it. over there. Yeah. If you say it to yourself mentally, you, you're very, very aware of it and you can you can move on. Um, so I think, yeah, small kind of weaponized theory matters, but self-confidence and self-resilience is, is, is massive. And that's why I like things like the survival, because all of that builds resilience training is resilience training. Whether you're fighting a man in a ring or living in the hills for three days. All of it just gives you a sense of capability and confidence. And that, that, that really is... Why, no, I, I agree. It, it matters more than anything else, in, in my personal opinion as well. And, you know, I, I really kind of was thinking about what you were saying that, Fairburn, right? Because isn't that a lot of what he was trying to accomplish with his system? I mean, he wouldn't have a lot of time with the guys. But by the time he um, let them kind of go off to war battle, am I correct in saying that he, his his whole theory was it's really important that they are confident that they can overcome this situation right yeah 
And he's a military man. And the military is run on process, you know, SOP, standard operating procedures. And it means that even the most idiotic of idiots can remember what they've been told to do and do it. You know, you think of most people in the military, uh, and, and I think I'll be forgiven for saying this, most are stupid. They are, you know, like a lot of guys are just, what we'd in the UK say, is thick as pig shit. Like they, you know, there's a lot of very clever people. There's also a lot of stupid people. And that reflects society as a whole. There are more idiots than there are clever people. Mm -hmm. But if you make a pattern, a process, a, a thing to do when you're faced with a stimuli and you burn that into someone's mind, the idiots and the clever people do the same thing and everything will be beneficial. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when it comes to Fairburn, you've got some guys which are old, some are young, you know, some are spies, some are soldiers. It's a big variable mixed pot of people. And as we know, most people are stupid. So if you can burn a couple of standard operating procedures into their mind when it comes to fighting, that gives them confidence and they don't lose their cool. Mm. And I think it's I think gutter fighting is more about not losing your cool than it is learning how to fight. Yeah. So for example, you, you take like a, an SOE agent, a spy, an OSS agent, and you're there and you're holding you're holding the documents. And they're being looked at. If you have in your mind that I could edge a hand blow someone and that could be quite effective, me convincing a guard that these are legitimate documents is much easier because I'm no longer so afraid. So having greater capability for violence lessens the likelihood that you'll need it because you are cool and you are confident and you are calm. And that is something that all humans can sense. Mm. Um, so so I think that, you know, the main benefit of Fairburn's gutter fighting and all World War II combatives is it gave people an answer to a problem, you know, a universal answer that everyone can get really quickly. And people having that in their mind would give them the inner confidence and inner resilience to not fuck up their main job because no one's main job is chin jabbing people. You know, some people's main job when it comes to war is translation radioing codes industrial sabotage no one is being paid to chin jab another man so you know having gutter fighting keep your cool and keep your calm means that you can better get on doing the best thing for the war effort your actual job what you're paid to do and i, th I don't think that's talked about enough you know it having the gutter fighting allows you to better do the thing you're paid for as a soldier or as a spy or as an agent, because you are no longer that afraid of physical conflict that you mess up your main job. Tommy, how long would your typical OSS or SOE agent have studied gutter fighting? So there's lots of different sources on this, and it really is kind of uh, at which time in the war, and which role, uh, at which camp. You know, and there's so many camps in the UK and Canada and America. So on average, so, so some, some of the lower estimates are circa eight hours and some of the higher estimates are circa 21 hours. And then in special, rarer occasions, it's even longer. What is quite shocking, I find anyway. So I don't know if you know this, but my former life, I was a teacher, a school teacher. Mm -hmm. And what I found quite interesting is that a lot of these things were taught in blocks of one or two hours in a day of other stuff. So you might spend the day doing a couple of hours of radio, a couple of hours of translation, a couple of hours of lock picking, a couple of hours of gutter fighting. And that would repeat throughout the weeks, which is quite a strange way to give someone fighting skills. You know, if I, I had it my way, I'd rather have you for one solid day and have a really good day with you than an hour here, an hour there, an hour there. You know, I, I think that you could you could get across things a lot better. Even if you only taught five techniques in that day, you've got enough time to just drill it, drill it, drill it, drill it, drill it. Um, so you know, it's not a huge amount of time, and often it's split out into one to two hour chunks, sometimes as, as, as low as 45 minutes, amidst lots of other skills that you're needing to learn. Um, so it's not it's not a huge amount of time. But when it comes to commandos and soldiers, these are young, fit, tough men. Like you could give them the world's least effective martial art and they'd still make it work. 
because they're young, fit, tough men. Uh, and when you're that age and with that mentality and that fitness, and you're already armed to the teeth anyway, things have a way of coming together. Uh, so I don't necessarily think that it should have been more important. You know, a lot of people that are interested in the things that we're interested in will say, you know, oh, you'd be brilliant and they should learn more of it. And it's a shame that modern soldiers don't spend enough time doing all this stuff. But if you look at it in the cold light of day, a young fit man can fight pretty well naturally. And you can make them better, but, you know, at the end of the day, uh, they're all going to be good. When you come to things like uh, SOE and OSS and spies, they're less likely to be young or fit or strong or armed. And I think for those guys, it's a lot more important. You know, I'd say that gutter fighting is way more important for a spy or an agent than it is for a soldier, in my opinion, um, because you have to make up for your lack of physicality with technique and subtlety and surprise. Um, you know, that, that person that's posing as a Latvian typist, you know, they're not going to be a six foot two Scottish Royal Engineer. You know, this is, it's completely different level of need. Yeah. Um, so so it, do, it does matter. Um, it is very variable throughout the war, throughout the services, throughout the roles, but it's a lot lower than I think most people would expect. Do you happen to know, I always was told that a lot of what Fairburn originally taught is still kind of taught in essence, at least, uh, in the CIA, in the MI6 of today. Have you ever heard that? So, uh, the kind of the, the last mentions of it, so there's, there's a very prolific uh, SAS guy in the UK called Lofty Wiseman. And uh, he's very, in the UK at least, he's very famous. He teaches lots of survival stuff. He's written lots of books. Like he is, he's a, he's a kind of mini celebrity in that field. Uh, and a lot of his work, uh, which is more prolific in the kind of 70s, 80s, is very gutter fighting led. And there's a lot of talk of people still using and deploying those manuals, albeit relatively unofficially, in the 70s, 80s and early 90s. Mm. In the United Kingdom, there is no, there's no, across any of the armed services branches, any official or patronised system. So there's nothing mm. like you've got. You've got McMap and you've got the Army Combatives programs in the US. So you've got, you know, a curriculum there. Britain doesn't, but, you know, regiment by regiment, brigade by brigade, they might bring in a Krav Maga instructor mm. or another reality-based self-defense instructor. Or, you know, if they're really unlucky, they'll bring in an Aikido instructor. It depends whatever's been sold to the person looking after physical training. But it's not very often. It's not very organized. And it's very, very, very variable. Um, so, so we don't have that in any of our intelligence services or, or in our armed forces. There's no universal or official wow. system like, like you've got in the US. Um, people did a f unofficially use the guides and manuals in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, and also areas kind of areas of the former British Empire tended to hang on to them a bit longer. Um, but again, it's not been a hugely prolific part of, of, of what we do. Um, but then in the UK, there's a really big scene for military boxing, military rugby. There's lots of things that translate pretty well to unarmed fighting that a lot of soldiers do hmm. anyway. Yeah. Hmm. So the boxing being a good example, there's lots of really good British Army boxing teams, you know, Royal Marine boxing teams. In Na the Navy's really good at boxing. Yeah. Hmm. So... You know, that that is relatively prolific, but combatives is is not on the radar in any way in in Britain. I think it will be because warfare's changed and it's a lot closer. Yes. You know? um, America, with you know infinitely more money and resources and time than most armies in the world, when it comes to training, you know America is often quite far ahead because it's got the budgets to invest in. Mm. Let's make a big marine unarmed program you know britain might look at that and say can we afford to spend a couple of million on getting it testing it trialing it rolling it out training the personnel you know the health and safety all the crap that comes with it you know for us as martial artists we think oh just hear a couple of moves and roll it out but it's a, it's a huge expense 
if you think about introducing a, a combative system to any force, it suddenly starts to cost a lot of time and money and resource. And what's the reward for that resource? Um, so it, it's sad that it's not in there. And as a martial artist, I think it'd be cool that if it did exist for us. But by the same token, if I was a man in charge of the budgets and the times of training soldiers, could I hand on heart say, would I swap an IED awareness lecture for learning how to chin jab? I'm not sure I could honestly do that and be an ethical human being. You know, what could we lose and swap? This is, you know, these are all tough decisions. None of them are easy decisions. Um, but warfare is getting closer. There's going to be a lot more need for, for CQB skills. Um, so the teams that really need that are going to receive better budgets to bring in better personnel, mm -hmm. naturally. Uh, and, and Britain will tend to contract people that are good at that stuff to come teach the people that need it most. Um, but, but sadly, no. Uh, it would be lovely to say that there's like a, a fair burn continuum across the armed forces. But it, in reality, you know, there's no passion for it and there's no desire for it. And there's no one senior in the British Army really going at it, that really kind of lobbying for it. Um, mm. Whereas you is obviously really lucky to have people like Matt Larson who really pushes it. Now, I don't personally, in fact, I've got the, the Marine, the map system curriculum here, right next to my leg here. And there's a lot of stuff in there. I'm really surprised has made the cut. Yeah. But it's cool. It's cool that it exists. Yeah. Well, just like Fairburn's system of old, right? I mean, there's, there's stuff in there that why the hell is it in there? And then there's good stuff as well. So if there was going to be uh, to kind of start to round things off here, yeah. like you said, CQB is becoming more prolific. The way that we fight, it unfortunately is getting closer. Uh, our enemies are becoming different. You know, just a few years ago, we were in the sandbox. Now we very well may find ourselves in the Orient somewhere. If there was going to be a modern system of defend you or gutter fighting or any self-defense system for the military, if there was going to be something deployed and you were in charge of this, what would this system start to look like in a modern day? It would be split into two distinct parts. So there would be attribute development phases, which would be about boxing, wrestling, bayonet fighting, but all competitive, all mm. painful, competitive, real risk of, of, of damaging, because it's only with the fear that there is growth. So, you know, for example, the, the Paris, the, um, the parachute regiment in the UK, they do something called milling. And you put on gloves and you're not allowed to defend. You're not allowed to move that much. You got to punch the shit out of each other for, for, for 90 seconds or a minute. And your job is to just completely dominate the opposition. And even if you suck, is to not fall over and die. You know, so again, it builds, it builds uh, stuff like that's important. So I would, I would build in two phases. I think the early sections and times will be built on building confidence that you can have a scrap, that you can wrestle, you can box, you can just do stuff physically. Um, and then it would probably be, I, 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 would, I, would, I would have faith in a lot of the gutter fighting systems, you know, chin jabs, edge of hand blows, move into a rear naked choke. That's, all oh, in many instances, many people need. Um, so, so yeah, I, I could see that. I think the main thing is to not have it done in, not have it become what Krav Maga has become. Mm -hmm. Every single attack scenario has a pre-prescribed official response. You know, a response for the left-handed grab, a response for the right-handed grab, a response to this attack or that attack. You should spend less time thinking about what the enemy is going to do and just focus on what you're going to do. You need to start to think like a criminal. A criminal only cares what they're going to do to you. They don't care what you do back. It doesn't even cross their mind that you'll defend yourself. They're just going to go through you. And I think that's the type of training that the military needs to instill. You know, very selfish, very asymmetrical. You know, not if he does this, I do that. It's just I know how to do an axe hand and I'm just going to smash a man to hell with it. And I need to get good at doing that. Sat down, standing up, carrying my rifle, lo lost my rifle. You know, that that's important. Um, so unlike Krav Maga, 
because the, the building blocks of Krav Maga are the same building blocks as defending, uh, go to fighting. You know, boxing, wrestling, jujitsu, the, the ingredients the same, but the cake is different. And I think the most important reason why the cake is different is that gutter fighting is quite loosely applied. You know, mm. if you watch a lot of the videos, you know, the edge of hand blow, it's not prescribed. You go one, two, three, four. You just smash someone with it until they stop moving. Yeah, there's no formulaic responses to things or there's few formulaic responses to things. Um, and that's the important bit. It needs to be able to be very asymmetrical. Um, so sporting attribute development for confidence and competence and then very aggressive, very asymmetrical gutter fighting with a much redacted syllabus for me. Um, what I would say is it's quite hard because today a soldier's job is almost like a policeman's job. They spend as much time arresting as they do shooting. And that comes with its own challenges. Uh, being able to peaceably look after a protest and stop that protest happening, be it at home or abroad, being able to arrest and detain people that, you know, if you're too rough detaining someone you thought was a terrorist that's not a terrorist, you might have just made a new terrorist. Yeah. <laughs> Let's be honest, no one wants to be shamed in front of their family, pinned to a floor, arm twisted behind their back, and then said, oh, you're not that guy, you just look a bit like him. You know, so for teams that do need to arrest and restrain and control and, and capture, um, it's really important for them to spend time learning things like and you know I'm, I'm not always one for this but the great thing about systems like brazilian jiu-jitsu is that it, you can have non-devastating restraint of a human being and um, floor-based restraint of a human being without completely destroying them and there is there is a need for some of that alongside the gutter fighting and the sporting stuff you need to, you know, as much as it hurts us to say it, you do need some nice stuff that, that is that is calm and considered because we're a lot more of an accountable military now mm -hmm. and we can't just go kicking indoors and shooting people all the time because the enemy is often unclothed. It, 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 it could be anyone. So you can't risk alienating the public because of your bad self-protection decisions. So I think being able to scale your own force, being able to scale your own force is important anyway. If you only know deadly force, the fight that you might be forced to get into at the parking space, you know, the ends don't justify the means. Yeah. You, know, you could never look at a jury in the world and say, we fought over a parking space, so I smashed him in the track here and he died. No one's going to think that's reasonable. So you always need to be able to scale force because violence is a form of communication. It can be very, very high. It can be very, very low, but it's a scale. It's always a scale. And, a good martial artist, a good combatives person has immediate grasp of where they are at the scale. I'm at level 10 threat. I'm at level two threat. You know, that's a skill that a good combatives person has, knowing where that threat scale is and knowing that at any point a two could turn to a 10 or a 10 can drop to a two. What you thought was a 10, as soon as you twist him and grab him and he turns into cream cheese, you know, gets all soft and is afraid. You know, you might need to tone down your level of violence or dial it up. You know, the, that's a skill. That's an important skill. Agreed. Agreed. And for those of you out there who have minimal experience, guys, Tommy knows what he's talking about here. I mean, I have sat down and interviewed a lot of people in my time, Tom, and uh, you clearly know your know your gravy, so to speak. And it's uh, it's been a pleasure talking with you, man. Now, before I let you go, dude. Um, Modern Bartitsu and Shanghai School of Fighting. Dude, tell us about your books because these are some pretty badass things here. Man, they're, they're, they're old school books. So, for example, so this is my Bartitsu book here. Um, and it's all very kind of Victorian esque. And they're predominantly technique orientated because a lot of these old school techniques you will only find through going through very old books and manuals. And so, <laughs> my job here really is is aggregating them, going through lots of sources, pulling together what I think is the best of them in terms of techniques, combinations, training approaches. So unlike a lot of books now, which tend to be all theory, there's no point in me making another theory book because there are brilliant combat psychologists and very clever people. So, you know, I've gone old school and it's cool, interesting fighting techniques for people that want to try it out. Um, so 
Modern Bartitsu, you can find that on Amazon, and the Shanghai School of Street Fighting, which we shot in World War II clothes. And again, every single page is a technique, a principle, an approach. Every technique has stuff in it that you can do immediately and follow. And unlike a lot of the Fairburn books, it shows how they chain together or how you could chain right. them together. Because a lot of the World War II stuff is technique one, technique two, technique three, but nothing about how they come together. And that's what I've tried to do with those books. Showcase to people that, yes, learn them individually. And how do you chain this stuff together in a way that makes sense? Um, but I'm really proud of them. You know, I try and keep them as cheap as humanly possible for the cost of making them because they're not made by a publisher. Not, not enough people are interested in this field to really publish. And they would, you know, if I was to take this World War II book to a publisher, they'd tell me to half it. Yeah. And for me, I'm like, no, I'm going to double it. I want to make it big. I'm going to fill it with stuff. And hopefully the people out there enjoy that. Um, you know, I, I'd rather give them good quality content. And in a couple of years, I'm also open to the idea that I might hate everything in this book. <laughs> but <laughs> I make a new one. But I'm, I'm very, very proud of it. And I think, you know, my litmus test is if I could post this back in time and William Fairburn open this, would he enjoy it? Or would he not? Uh, and I really think he would think this is a good book. And that's that's what I had in my mind. You know, to do the man good honour, you know, make a book I think he would enjoy reading and put on his shelf. And uh, I hope I've done that. Um, but you know, people, I'm always open. You know, people read it, critique it, let me know what I can do better next time. That's important. Um, but we're, you know, you're the same with your channel and what you do. There's not enough creators of stuff out there. So, you know, if people are listening to this and they've got something inside them where they want to write it, they want to make films, whatever they want to do, just do it. You know, don't worry about it. Just do it. You know, the more people doing it and trying it and experimenting with it, the better it is for everybody. We all benefit. I look at loads of other people's stuff. A lot of people probably look at my stuff. It's a big open community. So you know, the closed bits of the community, leave those guys alone. You know, be, be brave enough to, to put your stuff out there and people will recognize and support it um, wherever you are on your journey just starting out or you know very established you know there's always great benefit for, for sharing and making content that's the thing i think people really gravitate towards your channel man is you're really open you're really just encouraging of everybody to like you said try it out what's the worst that could happen you know it's it's all just a big experiment anyway so tommy i really appreciate you coming on giving us some time talking about yourself and you know, also about uh, Bartitsu, gutter fighting, all of the old school cool stuff. And um, before I let you go, uh, Facebook, YouTube, yep. is there a website? There's not a website. I need to get around to it. I'm just too damn lazy. But I need to go. If you type in Tommy Joe Moore on Facebook, add me and uh, I'll follow you. Um, or go on YouTube and type in the Bartitsu Lab and you'll find me. I look like an egg with a ginger beard. You won't miss me. <laughs> Perfect, man. Well, thanks again for coming on. Um, it's been a freaking pleasure. And uh, I'll look forward to as you pump out more videos and uh, get on more podcasts. I know you've been on a few um, podcasts already. I mean, there was one in particular that I found uh, managing violence podcast with Joe Sounders, which uh, I listened to a little bit of and was definitely impressed. And you talk a little bit more about your background as far as you know, tie fighting and stuff like that, which it was cool to hear. So I encourage you guys out there to go check that out, learn more about what they're doing over at Barkitsu Labs. So until next time, guys, please remember you are your first and the last line of defense, and I will see you in the next Tactical Podcast.